Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus today. This is episode 3 of 6 on the internet. This is a podcast style show. We take a big topic and we break it into little pieces so we get it a bit better, all of us. Yesterday and the day before, we talked about how the internet works and how it got to you and also what like the deep web and the dark web is and how the internet even got invented. But today we're gonna talk about how safe the internet is, how secure it is. Most of internet security comes down to one word, encryption. The word encryption comes from the Greek word cryptos, meaning hidden or secret. And devices like modems and set-top boxes and smart cards and SIM cards, they all use some form of encryption. Some is stronger than others. Every time someone uses an ATM, buys something online with their smartphone, makes mobile phone calls, presses a key fob to unlock their car, encryption is used to make sure that that network connection is safe. Digital rights management systems, or DRM systems, are on things like iTunes movies and songs, and those things prevent unauthorized use or reproduction of copyrighted material. Even DVDs had some kind of encryption on them. This is a, an example of protecting our data. Security is important. Even HDMI cables were designed in part to make sure that video gets from one place to another securely along a protected line. Encryption is not a new thing. It's basically a fancy word for codes, right? In 100 BC, Julius Caesar used encryption to send messages to his generals. Known as the Caesar cipher, each character was substituted by another character to form a completed message. And in this case, Caesar replaced all of the letters by the letter three letters in advance. He shifted everything three places. So the letter A was written as the letter D. And the letter B was written as the letter E. So the name Trace would come out as Wadf. Yeah, I would not understand that. But that encryption is really simple. So as you can imagine, it's pretty easy to crack some encryptions. Because once you have the key, no matter how complicated that encryption is, you're in. Once you understand what's being shifted around, you've cracked the code. And as computers become more powerful, encryption keys have to advance as well. If my software can crack a key or an algorithm, the encryption method is basically useless. Anyone can read that data as long as they have this software. The Enigma machine in World War II that we cracked the codes for was useless once the encryption was unlocked. Coincidentally, of course, this was one of the first computers that was created to do this. So encryption is just fancy talk, meaning codes. As a side note, though, encryption is also really, really cool. There's a new encryption method in development that uses photons and quantum theory to store the key to the encryption. So it makes it pretty much impossible to crack, or at least impossible right now. Quantum key distribution works by using a standard encryption algorithm, the same as anything that you might use on your computer right now. But the sender encrypts the data and then transmits it to the receiver, and it's all done in one place. But the key for that is encoded in a single photon. Then that photon is entangled or placed in a correlated state with a second photon. It's, this is just awesome, by the way. And then they, I mean, I can't even explain it all now because quantum entanglement is super complicated, but suffice it to say the two photons, once they're entangled, are exact copies. They carry exact copies of the information. So they're spinning at the same rate or whatever. Now, once you send that second photon over, no matter how far away it is, theoretically, it should constantly and forever and be entangled with this photon. So we would know if anything was tampered with, and we would also both have the same key. So any attempt to observe or measure one photon would affect the other correlated photon regardless of where they were on the planet. That is a super secure system. Stuff is super crazy, but it's like the cutting edge of computing and kind of an extraordinarily nerdy and maybe boring for some of you, but exciting for other people is a really awesome way. We can't, of course, generate a single reliable photon on demand yet and transport it really far, but they're working on it, so someday. If encryption is crackable, if all encryption is pretty much crackable, how are we going to maintain data security? How do we keep ourselves safe online? Well, a popular way is to hire hackers or outside agencies to test their systems. These hackers are called white hats, and they literally try to hack the network that they're hired to hack. 
They want to find vulnerabilities and then consult in ways to fix those vulnerabilities. This is a gigantic industry. Some former hackers go into this after the heat comes down on them. The security industry is estimated to generate more than $85 billion globally in 2016. So an example of a white hat hacker might be Barnaby Jack, who died at the age of 35. He brought ATMs on stage at a 2010 security conference and showed that he could hack the machines to spit out money right there in front of everybody. He was then later hired by ATM manufacturers to check for vulnerabilities in their machines as a white hat hacker. Before his death, Jack was planning on showing that he could control pacemakers and defibrillators to send electric shocks and burn out the device remotely, literally killing people. Kind of serious. And all of this is to pressure companies to have better security. So if the internet is based on eventually broken encryption methods, and all encryption can be hacked or broken into, as long as you know the key, then why don't all companies and governments just hire white hat hackers? Because there are so many encryption systems. There's a lot of different types of encryption. And sometimes companies do hire hackers and the hackers don't find the way in. It's all about innovation. As long as we keep innovating, we'll be fine. But speaking of innovation in the computer world, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Intel. Intel drives innovation with products like processors, wearables, and devices for the Internet of Things, as well as within data centers, in the PC and beyond. So a big thank you to them and to watch yesterday's episode on the Internet and the deep world that's complicated and hidden within it. Click here now and please subscribe to Test2 Plus so you get all of our videos. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.